morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> okay. We're live, we're live, that's good. Um, my name is Carl Edo Michel. I'm a tech and video game journalist. So yes, I play video games and play with cool toys for a living. Uh, and uh, today we have a great panel. I'm really excited about that. Uh, another uh, more information about me, I'm also the uh, co-owner and executive producer of the Canadian Video Game Awards and also the co-founder of Northern Arena. You'll hear a lot about that in the next few weeks. It's our esports initiative. Uh, but today we're going to talk about gaming with a great panel here. And uh, we have like 15 minutes to, uh, to have a really cool discussion. And then you'll also be able to uh, ask questions uh, for like uh, 20 minutes. So you'll be part of that discussion also. Vous pouvez aussi poser vos questions en français, si vous voulez. We have uh, uh, someone on the panel who can answer those questions in French. Um, so let's start with introducing the panel. Uh, the first one here we have uh, Alex Parizzo. And Alex Parizzo is the managing director at Ubisoft Toronto. I heard Alex is an avid gamer and uh, I heard he plays a lot of video games. The, uh, the, the one who plays mo the more video games uh, uh, at the studio, so th this is really cool. Uh, Nathan Villa. Nathan Villa is the co founder and president of Cathy Barra Games. Uh, in the studio here based in Toronto, they do really cool games, so looking forward to talk to Nathan. Uh, Jason Key, which is the public and uh, policy government relation at, at council at Google and YouTube. So we're probably going to talk a lot about YouTube gaming and uh, all, the, all that cool stuff. And finally, we have Jeff Rive, and Jeff Rive is the Senior Marketing Manager at Xbox Canada. So Jeff is going to tell us more about the new Xbox, right Jeff? <laughs> Whoa. I, I guess yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's, let's start the conversation. Uh, um, and uh, we have a few questions, but I just want this conversation to be really uh, laid back. So I'm going to sit down and ask you my first question, and we can dive in. Um, I guess my first question is about community. Uh, I know that building community is really important for you guys, uh, for, the, for the video game industry. And if you work on, in a big studio like you, Alex, at Ubisoft uh, Toronto, or a smaller studio uh, like you, Nathan, I guess the strategy is different. So can you talk to us uh, more about community and how important it is? Maybe Alex, you can start. Yeah, I mean, um, at uh, UB for sure, like we're trying to get closer with um, digital distribution and uh, uh, Twitch and YouTube gaming and, and all that stuff now out there. But we're really trying to get it as close to players as possible. Uh, I mean, players are fans, they're people who love our brands. Um, they're the one who uh, you know interact with our games all the time. So we're really trying to get as close and entertain those communities. And we've, we've focused all the studios uh, to try to do that. We try to have developers engage with the community uh, also directly if possible. Um, we, um, we engage in community events as much as possible. We bring fans at uh, the studio all the time. So we're really trying to just like make sure that uh, we're in touch with our fans and we're, um, we're as close to them as possible. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it, when, it, when you break it down, whether it's on a massive scale or on a small scale, the goal is to have a group of people that are consistently playing the stuff you're putting it out not picking it up, playing it for 20 minutes, dropping it, and moving on. The goal is to create that relationship so that it's not only, uh, you're not only able to bring them into this, the one game, you're able to bring them into the, the studio or the, the brand or the kind of, you know, for us it's trying to make sure that there are a core group of people that we can talk to, whether it's on the forums on Steam or, uh, you know, through Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, all of those kind of social channels. We want to be able to speak to them as often as possible and as directly as possible, like Alex said, uh, because then they come, there's a chance that they will become fans of the studio, not just fans of the single piece of work that we've done. And the hope is that you can generate a community large enough, at least from my side, that every time you release something, you know that you have this core group that is at least going to be interested and knowledgeable about it, and hopefully then goes through and becomes an evangelist, becomes you know, your single biggest tool for promoting the game, which is word of mouth, which is our biggest fans on, whether it's on, you know, YouTube or Twitch or social, anything. Those, they sell more copies than any investment we make in traditional marketing or, or promotion. Uh, so building, the, starting with that community, starting with the direct conversations, starting with just even something as simple as like answering questions, yeah. Like leaving no question unanswered on any social channel. For us, that, that 
people are very, you'd be surprised how amazing of a relationship just being available creates. Um, and yeah, for us, I mean, we're really, when we're putting out a game, uh, if we always say like, we, we need this core group of fans. We need, you know, 40,000 people to buy into this, to, to get invested, to really like dive in. And then from there, we can see how it grows. And that was with Sword and Sorcery, which is our most successful project. It's a, probably creeping up on 2 million units. Uh, it started out with the goal of finding 50,000 people and really communicating with 50,000 people, and that happened in the first six hours. But we were sure that we weren't sure that that would happen, right? We weren't sure that that would. We knew that if we could get that small group of people and just communicate with them and actually make something directly for them, like build for that niche, that uh, then we could grow up from there. Then we could build that community. We could create a discussion that would grow larger, and hopefully that word of mouth would spread. Cool. I, you, you said fan of the studio instead of just being fan of the game. That's interesting. So this is something that, that is really important for you guys? I think it's important in video games, period. I think uh, there is a, a group of people who go to GameStop and they buy whatever it, their friends are talking about, whatever's cool. They don't really have a direct connection with games or, or gaming culture. Yeah. Uh, but then there's also a smaller but equally huge chunk of people where it is culture for them. It is not just kind of this thing that you do for entertainment, but it is part of their day to day life. It's something that they educate themselves on. It's something that they follow uh, instead of reading, you know, in Gadget or um, you know, Wired. They're reading Kotaku or uh, IGN, or they're they're following video games as a medium and as a culture. And those people know who makes their games. Those people know the actually down to the person. They they know who is involved in the studios, and they follow that really passionately. And community, like finding those people, I mean, it's, I hate to be super businessy, but those are also the people that buy the most games. Right? Those are the people that are the most financially invested in, in playing cool stuff. So communicating with those people and making them, uh, you know, giving them reasons to love the company, uh, to love, and I mean, I think everybody on this panel has, has done that extremely well. There are huge, there are people who are diehard Ubisoft fans, who are diehard Xbox gamers, who are massive YouTube fans, who just, like that is their single biggest medium for for consuming video game culture. I know for us, that's most of the stuff that we do, kind of trying to promote our work is on YouTube. That's that's our single biggest channel. Yeah, and I think from a Microsoft perspective, it's a bit more unique for us in that, that kind of think of community on three levels. Like as you kind of mentioned, like there's, there's Xbox fans who, you know, we want to enable them and their engagement with the Xbox brand and the platform in general. Then from a Microsoft, Microsoft perspective, we have our own franchises like Halo, like Gears of War, Forza, that each have their own sub-communities that we're trying to foster you know, engagement with and gameplay and just engaging with those brands. And then there's just the actual kind of technology and features we enable in the actual platform itself. And so that's enabling things like you know, chat, voice chat, um, community features in your social feeds on your platform, or bringing things like the Xbox app to Windows 10 or other mobile devices so you can have your your friends lists, your, your chats, and your achievements with you no matter what device you're on so that you can always be engaging and playing with whichever community you're part of on Xbox. And yeah, for us, community is actually kind of the be all and end all. We always talk about this with YouTube generally, that it's actually about building fans, not audiences, these massive fan bases. And take, take a step back, People in the room may not be that familiar. Gaming as a category of content on YouTube is massively successful. I mean, like, hugely, ridiculously successful. Uh, PewDiePie, Phyllis Kelber, who's basically out of uh, Sweden, he's the single most popular and successful YouTuber we have on the platform. He has 44 million subscribers to his channel. He's a gamer. He basically does gaming related content. Um, of the top 200 channels that we have on the platform, over 40% of them are all gaming related channels. We have, I think, 144 billion minutes of game-related content are watched every month on the platform. It is a huge category for us, which is actually why it is that we have actually a dedicated team that specializes in, in gaming, that actually works together very closely with the publishers and, and other kind of game developers and so forth. And it's actually why we deployed the YouTube gaming app, which is a specific gaming-related experience, which we launched in Canada in March. And it's absolutely huge. And Again, these YouTube gamers will basically do things which we call like let's play videos where they're actually playing through the video and they'll make commentary as they're going through and they have these massive audiences of people who constantly come back and actually watch them sort of play through the game. And that actually helps them interact directly with their fan bases because they build a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with their fans. 
which is why the fans keep coming back. The fans kind of relate to the content, they relate to the personalities. It's very personality driven. And similarly, when these YouTube creators will then interact with folks from, from the companies and when they actually will play through games that they actually like and they'll provide commentary and so forth, it actually also interacts very, very closely and very well with the, with the gaming industry because it provides a, basically a brand for them. And so essentially for us, we write a very much as a synergistic relationship yeah. um, where actually, again, so there's a, a promotional element that happens as well as actually a community building uh, relationship that happens because YouTube fans that are watching a certain gamer that get attracted to a game then migrate if they're not already a fan of a particular game or a particular company, then become them. Cool. That's good. That's, uh, something that I find is also interesting is that even when we're creating the game, we're becoming, be we're becoming better and better at having those hooks that people want to talk about or those, those things that people want to talk about outside of the game. Yeah. And there, you know, there's typical things like say uh, online features and make you want to you know get your friends to come and play with you but like even we call it systemic games games that have uh, you know systems like physics or crazy things that are happening when you play something and it feels like what you're experiencing is, is unique no one else has seen it then you want to engage with other people you want to you want to put it out there and uh, you show like, this is what happened to me, that's crazy. And you want to see other people experience things you haven't seen and the game makes you want to go back to the game. Yeah. So having that uh, anchored in our experiences, I feel that has made games very popular on social channels because you want to talk about it. And it's all, it all actually kind of comes back to the, how do you make your game stand out in the most, arguably the most crowded market we've ever seen. I mean, r right now there are more people making more better games than, than ever. I think it was last year, so People familiar with Steam, Steam is the, the largest platform for distribution, for downloadable distribution on PC. There's 130 million active users, and they count active users as someone who's purchased and played in like the last two months or a month. It's ridiculous. It's uh, a, a very, very rabid fan base. Um, yeah, and you see so many people uh, putting games out on that platform. They had more games last year than their entire history combined, and this year will be 40% more games than last year. So if you take the last two years combined, there's like 10 times more content than the entire history of Steam, which is like 12 years old. Um, and as a result, you have, you know, you're battling consistently with, you know, there's a game a day, three games a day, four games a day. And now that it used to be that the, a lot of the smaller publishers and smaller developers were, they were the first ones to arrive on Steam. Uh, support for PC would come later from a lot of the larger publishers. That's gone now. All of the larger publishers and developers are making games for Steam immediately because the market is so massive and so rabid. Uh, so as a result, you have a massive influx of competition for that one or two kind of single top spots. Um, but the good thing about Steam is that uh, there is you know, value in being in the top 100, the top 300, whereas it's much different, I think, on the App Store. But coming back to what Alex was saying, those kind of moments, those special kind of like uh, singular, like I did this and no one else has done this, so I want to show off, so I want to promote it. That's, those pieces are becoming critical to stand out. And the way that you stand out is by sharing those moments, whether it's streaming it, putting it up on YouTube. You, there's you know, startups like Forge that are built just to capture those moments uh, of kind of cowboyism in video games, and people are building games around those moments to make sure that their games are more shareable and more discoverable. Um, so it's like, it's almost flipping over where discoverability in games was a thing that you tried to do after you launched. You tried to promote or market or sell, and now it's the other way around, where you try to make sure that your project from the ground up has books that people will use to share. Yeah, yeah. I just think that there's a couple other things too in terms of earlier discoverability. Um, you, know, you tend to think of communities sometimes as kind of a marketing tool, maybe in a, in a more modern sense, but um, at a platform level, it, it also helps to actually shape products themselves in terms of, I know we're out there, we have forums and feedback uh, for Xbox fans to propose new features, uh, what feedback or bugs that they see, the community can vote on that, it goes to the top and our engineers can address it. Uh, there's other things that we've launched, like the game preview program. Uh, where ind independent developers could choose to release on our platform to consumers and it's essentially an unfinished version of the game where uh, those people who decide who know they want this game immediately and are willing to take an unfinished product and help essentially test it and give feedback it's an opportunity for them to kind of get in on the ground level and actually shape uh, what the finished product is going to look like uh, by the time it would normally launch which is pretty unique and all fueled by kind of the, the gaming community and their 
um, the desire to kind of get in on the, the ground floor, however soon that could be as the game experience of interest them. And similarly, is why it's certainly important to us as well as important to the sort of the consoles. The integration of, of basically uh, of a busy streaming into like the consoles in the current generation was huge. Like as you can imagine, you get a massive lift out of that, yeah. especially because you know Twitch is obviously pretty dominant in the space as well, especially for live streaming. And basically, the ability to really start doing this of like the touch of a button, it also gets the community very engaged, and also basically allows them to parse down their content and share little clips so they can actually share it with their friends. And all the major platforms basically all integrated that and made it a fully functional thing at launch. And actually, that is, in my view, very much improved over the intervening years with the various software updates. Like the ability to share the content to build that community has been huge. And, and, and let's go back to content because this is really important. You know, back in the days we had cartridges. You know, I don't remember Nintendo, we used to blow in the cartridge to make it work. And then after that, we had CDs and DVDs, and now it's all digital now. Uh, with a platform like uh, Steam, where you were talking about Steam or, or Xbox Live or PSN, what's the strategy now for you guys to, to release games? And I know you, you touched a little bit about that, uh, Nathan, but what's your strategy in general when you want to release a game? Or, or, or more racing all the channels, right? Like uh, digital distribution is huge for sure. I mean, it's kind of interesting because if you close, close the loop, someone can look at a video of someone playing doing something cool, and then in the next five minutes, they'll have purchased your game. So it's so, it's so easy now that, that like the consoles have made it easy, and the Steam has made it easy. So you, you can close that loop uh, right away. So I think it's uh, it's been probably the most freeing and most powerful thing. And part of it too, I think, with digital distribution, that is a massive game changer. I find is that it's not only the game anymore, like Nathan was saying, it's like we're trying to have our players not come just for the game and then leave, but now we can support the game over a really long period of time by adding content, tweaking it, uh, looking at what players are doing in our games and adapting the game for that, to balancing it and stuff like that. So games have become more like, a, I guess, a platform that lives on through uh, you know the year, a couple years, until you know the next one in the brand comes out. So your community is centered around the brand, your game kind of like is just an event, and then there's multiple events during the year where you can provide more content, you can keep the community engaged, and that's because of digital distribution in a way. And I think we're gonna see massive transformation um, related to that in the coming years. Same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for us as a platform holder, I think ultimately it's about offering consumers choice, and I think uh, there's definitely a growing number of consumers who are seeing the, the benefits of digital, whether it's just being able to purchase and download something immediately and be ready to play with their friends when the game launches. And I think there's also a, a group of gamers who also just, they love discs, they want something physical in their hands, whether it be because of the trading value, the collectible nature of the skew perhaps, and there's tons of limited skews that comes with sweet statues that people like to collect. So I, I think there's definitely transformation come, taking place that digital is growing, but I, I think you know, from, from Xbox perspective, it's always being able to offer consumers choice of whether or not they want something digitally or they want to go to retail and get a disc. And just to jump in, not obviously because Google, we're all about the digital, even like Google Play Games, which is our distribution platform for Android, it's like it's completely digital. Um, from a platform perspective, especially from the console, I can also see some compelling reasons why you want to maximize that choice. A, you want to make sure you're serving your customer. Secondly, those of us who live in urban areas tend to forget not everyone has access to high-speed broadband. And in this day and age, like I pulled down uh, a day one digital on a AAA console game, and it's a 44 gig file now. Yeah. And that is that is half of my cap. <laughs> no YouTube for me. Um, and that's the other compelling reason. And especially when you're thinking outside of urban areas, or especially you're thinking other markets outside of, say, North America, where access to broadband is not that great, you want to make sure you're serving those markets properly as well. And also you want to make sure that you are feeding people, uh, giving them uh, the ability to, again, become super fans, become the, like, the highest of the high players, the, I mean, on the mobile side, they call them whales, and I think that's very different when it comes to PC, console, um, we're not looking for those type of players, we're looking for players that uh, are going to, like, actually take, spend the time in the game, um, but, Sometimes the physical stuff is the stuff that allows them to express their fandom better than digital stuff because it is, it's a, a communicate, you can communicate it. Right? It's very difficult to like put your phone in front of a friend and be like, see this awesome costume I got for this, buying this. Like that's, it's really it's way, way easier to show them the statue that you got on your shelf when they're over having a drink or to show the t-shirt that you got. And so I think there is, uh, the, the digital component enables developers to 
like Max said, close the loop so cell games easier. Uh, it makes it far cheaper to produce games because you don't have to worry about manufacturing as much. Um, but it also, you have to think about that side. You have to, uh, the, the disc is going, is not going anywhere, right? Even though a substantial portion of, of most companies' revenues are shifting to digital, I think there's always gonna be a piece more there for the, the, the collectors, for the people who love, whether it's they love going to GameStop, GameSpot and, and, or GameStop and trading in games. Like people love that process of like, I give you one and I get, like there's something, you know, the barter system is still very, Enjoyable for some people, um, but for us, we we think about physical as, as exclusively a ways for super fans to show their super fandom. Because we don't have to produce, we don't. We, I mean, we've had one disc game in ten or one retail game in ten years. It's not important to us from a studio standpoint, but we always try to make shirts or statues or some kind of thing that people can express their fandom. Talking about that, like the, mu the music and television industry uh, obviously switched to a subscription model. Uh, you know, we have the Netflix of the world, we have the Google Play Music, uh, where you can pay uh, an amount uh, per month or per year to uh, to have access to that content. And it seems that video game is going that route also. Uh, we see a lot of, of DLCs, uh, we see um, um, season pass. Uh, do you guys think it's uh, the way to go for the industry? And uh, What's your, I guess, your strategy to uh, to uh, uh, send that content to the uh, to the plan, the DLC, and the season pass? Those services like Netflix, I feel like, were an, an additional distribution model. And you know, when you look at a movie, say it's got it's going through multiple cycles. It releases in theaters, then it's you can rent it, then it usually ends up on Netflix. Um, so it's an extra. It's like it's the long tail, say, of movies and TV shows. Um, and I think you're starting to see that with video games as well because there's so many great games that have been produced like you know five years ago six years ago and those games usually did not necessarily have a big like or you know we, we were selling a game and then three months later people were starting to forget it and then sell another game so I think what we're seeing now with the industry maturing is that there's multiple new ways to access the content so one way for sure that we're a hundred percent embracing and is I'd say the dominant model right now is to a buzz around the game launch and then try to support it over a long time while well, building community what we're talking about but there's more and more additional distribution model that are also becoming successful and the platforms have done that so some service subscription services and publishers are embracing that as well um, and I guess we're starting to experiment now with like what kind of games are successful on those platforms and what kind of shape it's going to take in the future and I feel like there's a place for it but I don't see it as becoming the distrib dominant distribution model in games yeah, I mean, we've seen people try to do the kind of streaming games thing numerous times, whether it was online or Gaikai, which got bought by yeah. Sony and turned into PlayStation. Now, um, they they are there. Um, I for us, uh, I I've been a huge fan of backwards compatibility on Xbox One. That's been a massive. So you buy games on your old Xbox 360. When you bought an Xbox One, you you used to know if you bought a PS3 and then ended up upgrading to a PS4, all the content that you had digitally was not playable on your new version. So all of the stuff that you bought, was downloadable, was locked to that box. And now on Xbox One, you can actually, they're slowly but consistently allowing you to play those backwards compatible games, which, I mean, we have people coming in and because it got announced that month that one of our games is backwards compatible, all of a sudden we have an influx of players that were like, oh, I own this game and I loved it and I haven't touched it in four years and I came back to it because I saw that I could play it on my TV, I didn't have to hook up another box. Um, and, and that, in, in terms of enabling community, has been really uh, really interesting for us because we have a few games on Xbox 360. Um, in terms of the season pass stuff, I think that's one of the more predominant ones these days. I think people are really trying to think about how, like, getting a player to invest early in all of the additional content so they know how much content can be kind of budgeted for. Um, I think it's a really interesting model. I think it's, again, a great way for uh, super fans to, like, buy in very early and, and feel like they're, you know, part of something. Um, but I, I think I think it is ever evolving. I think people are going to come up with new kind of different models. We have Humble Bundle, uh, which is, 
a service on PC for PC, Mac, and Linux games where you pay whatever price you want and you get this group of games and if you pay over a certain price you might get a couple extra games but you can pay a dollar and get seven games. And those games are traditionally, I did, the, I did the, the numbers and they're traditionally 14 months old or older so they're well in their long tail. They're probably generating you know, 10 to 15% of their entire lifetime revenue over the last you know, year or two years that they're going to be in that long tail. So they're, you know, they're done in a lot of ways. They're, they're, they're making pennies. Um, and then Humble Bundle provides that kind of two-week bump where your older titles can come back and make an impact that can generate meaningful revenue all off of just you know, type in a number and that's what you pay to get a game. Uh, for us, that's been, we've done that a couple of times with our games, usually when they're 16 months old or so. Um, and it's been an, uh, an awesome kind of model for us to take old good stuff that people still kind of would want, but never tip over the edge. It was never cheap enough for them, but they were still interested. Um, so that, that, that's a, you know, it's, it's like Alex said, it's kind of this kind of chain of like, you have a launch, then you have your post-launch content that sometimes is paid or sometimes is free, and then you have you know, the next step, which might be a massive sale on the platform, and then you have another step, and then you have Humble Bundle maybe, and then like, it, it, the, the more of those steps there are, the better chances uh, we have of finding fans and, and then generating revenue. Yeah, I think the comparison to like a Netflix type service is easy just because games and movies are big, big entertainment. But I think the fundamental difference is that like, once a movie hits a theater, that's kind of the finished product and it's never going to change. Whereas gaming sort of evolved into these living, breathing things that change over time. And how the creators choose to change it over time varies. So, you know, like for some shooters, they might release map packs for free. Other companies might decide to charge for them. Um, they might release free updates that augment the game over time that that's why you're seeing these different business models emerge through things like Seasons Passes, some free updates, some paid DLC. Um, and that's why publishers are experiencing, experimenting with different models just to see what works, to essentially you know, both give gamers what they want and the content for the games that they love, but also maximize the business. I, mean, I, I would agree with everything that's been said. I think the dynamics of each individual content industry, for lack of a term, you know, music versus film and TV versus gaming, right, so forth, is very different. And what kind of works for each of them is very different. I think, you know, the gaming industry in particular has actually been well ahead of the curve with respect to experimenting with different business models. Lots of different reasons. They were always digital industry, they were always externally, so you focus on kind of global marketplaces that kind of were very willing to sort of try out stuff, new stuff that works outside of the conventional retail, you buy it, you own it, that's it. Yeah. And things evolve much more rapidly. And because the nature of the content is interactive, it means there's things that you can do with respect to DLC, with respect to uh, in-app purchases, with respect to all this kind of thing that you, that you can't necessarily do in other uh, industries. And as a consequence, there's been a lot of experimentation with that. And so with that, I think there will be experimentation, as Nathan said, there was and has been some attempts on sort of a, a all-you-can-eat subscription model. Um, my senses is there to, to make success. The fact that online still isn't around is an indication of that. And so we'll think, see, I, I expect that also there will be more experimentation on uh, ongoing basis. And much like, again, when you have to think back to how Netflix came about, it, Netflix was all long tail content once upon a time, where basically it was all old stuff that really wasn't actually moving in sort of in the iTunes and so on and so forth anymore, and so it kind of made sense. I see, and that's what PlayStation is doing with PlayStation now, I think that actually kind of makes sense. Um, I think you know, Xbox will be very competitive because they're focusing on backwards compatibility to the library that you already have, which I think is very appealing to their base because it means that you don't have to subscribe to a service to get access to games that you already want. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I think there's going to be this competitive dynamics and a different model to try. What about the free content that, you, um, that the players can get when uh, they subscribe to uh, PlayStation Now or Xbox Live? They have every month, uh, or uh, Xbox Gold, they have every month a free game. Does that help uh, you guys? Is that something that boosts the... Uh... I think it depends on the kind of game you're... Yeah. Like, I mean, we were talking about Rocket League. Yeah. And you're trying to, basically, when you're launching something, a new game, you're trying to build the community. Yeah. Because you want people talking about your game, you want people engaged. Um, so if you, you're the right type of game, and you piggyback on those distribution channels, you can have massive, massive success. I, I personally think that Rocket League became majorly successful because it was featured. So yeah. And then like people got on board, started playing it, talked to their friends about it, it was easy to get the game, and now it's massive success. Yeah. And so uh, I, don't, I don't think that it applies to every type of game, but like for some games, when you're trying to build an audience quickly, I think it's really great, it can be really powerful. We've done a lot of, I'm going to quite a bit, we did 
So our last game super tied for us was uh, true with games with gold about five months after launch. Uh, when we launched it on PS4 and PlayStation Vita, it was free with PS Plus. It launches in Japan today, free with PS Plus. If anybody's watching from Japan. Um, <laughs> uh, We've played around a bunch with it, uh, and I, I think there's like a real, it's a, to me it's a, like the biggest dichotomy in the video game business right now because it adds tremendous value for games that don't, uh, for either the type of games that are perfect for it, which is traditionally multiplayer games where scale of community matters the most. So your goal is to get as many people in as possible and then you can over, over lifetime earn the revenue back by some of the DLC, which Rocket League has done exceptionally. Um, the flip side is, uh, games that are that that are more niche or smaller market. Uh, uh, predominantly, the games with gold and PS Plus services are independent games, smaller, uh, you know, five-hour experiences, downloadable only. Um, and for us, it's it's a balance of like how how well do we think the game is going to do or continue to do versus how much uh, value comes from getting a ton of players. Um, and the upside of it is that ton of players, is the kind of spreading the audience, is the growing the name and brand. The downside is that you're training players that that type of game is, are, are worthless um, or have no value because you're not equating payment with receipt of content. You pay once a year your, your fee uh, and then every month you get something and there is no kind of like correlation between the act of purchasing and, and creating value. So I do worry a lot about uh, training players to expect certain types of content, which just so happens to be the content that my studio makes, uh, as uh, something that you should just wait and get for free. I think there's, it, it has a challenge. Fortunately, both of the platforms have been very good at ensuring that the promotion and the kind of the way that it's marketed and, and given to players is not in a like, oh, hey, you're also a user free game, congratulations, you got free shit. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, they're events, they're massive, they're big, they're promoted well, there's marketing dollars put behind it, they're treated extremely respectfully, mm -hmm. and they're made into something that makes players feel like they're part of an inner club because they subscribe to Gold or because they subscribe to PSN. And I like that part, I think that's the balance between devaluing and, and ensuring there still is value. I can, yeah, so what this is, is so we have a service called Xbox Live and Xbox Live Gold. Um, so it's traditionally, it's a subscription, so you can pay by month or you can get like a full year for 60 bucks and that gives you access to do things like multiplayer uh, on the service, um, get discounts on content via the store. And part of the added value in that is that every month we'll give Xbox Live Gold subscribers two free Xbox One games and two Xbox 360 games that now will also be backward compatible. So it's, it is a reward and a value add for Xbox Live Gold subscribers on our platform. And those are available for a limited time that you, as a reward and as a thank you, you can get them for free, download them now, and then the next month we'll have a new set of games. So the other part of it, I, if he's willing to answer that, great. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. We definitely work closely with the publishers. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We can't talk about specific business arrangements, but we're definitely working with the publishers to figure out what are the best games based off of the month that we want to include, and what's in the best interest of the publishers, and what are they willing to put on the service for free. Yeah. And something that's also worth noting, again. Maybe I'll comment to this too. Is most games go through a particular sort of sales cycle, especially those on console. It's very spiky at the beginning, and then it kind of tails off. And so I think part of the value I've always seen from Xbox Live like, and Gold and games with Gold is also it's actually it's getting games that have otherwise kind of tapered off a bit back into the marketplace and they spike up again. And certainly, there's actually been times where either I because I missed a promotion or so forth, or actually I, it's incented me to buy games myself. Cool. I want to talk now about linear broadcasting content and video game. Um, you know, now with Xbox, uh, the Xbox One, you can plug your TV, uh, your Xbox, watch TV, uh, you have your PPR, but you also have content now that is created and it's, uh, it's you know, TV shows and video game. Uh, the best example is Quantum Break, who, who was launched uh, recently. So do you see that, um, it's, a, it's a, well, do you see, do you think there's gonna be more and more content created like that? Like, 
TV shows or like audiovisual traditional uh, content and video game mixed together? I mean, I can speak to at least from a quantum break perspective. I think that was a very particular vision from Sam Lake at Remedy, who a lot of his career has been bringing kind of cinematics and that style to video games and finding kind of a perfect formula of how they come together to make a really cool experience for gamers. I think it was incredible what he did with, with Quantum Break in terms of the quality of the production of the TV component uh, as well as the video game. Uh, then what he did in the video game actually impacted the, the TV content that you would see after completing each level. And so I think it's up to kind of each creator based off what of the vision is that they want to create for the experience. Really. One of the things we've seen a lot is uh, Tie into Jason here. Um, a lot of the people who, or a lot of the content that is created based off of games is showing up on YouTube as YouTube specific content. Mm -hmm. So um, I know a lot, there is like, uh, you know, Red versus Blue, uh, which is a perfect, it's a, the original kind of, like the, the original you know, spawn of Halo that's still going like yeah. 10 years later or something. Uh, I think there's a lot of ability to bring in that style and a lot of it comes from fans rather than coming from the, the companies themselves. So uh, we did a project with a studio in Vancouver, the game's called Don't Starve. It's, it's millions and millions and millions of players, one of the most actively played games on Steam, one of the most actively played games on PS4 and on Xbox and on Wii and on Mac. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and there are people who are creating their own linear content based off of the game. And then, so the, the studios or the game companies are not actually creating it themselves, they're enabling and almost incentivizing fans to generate their own linear content based on the brands that they've made. Um, you know, it's basically every popular game, if you go on YouTube and search for that brand, there'll be like a bunch of promotional videos made by the companies, there'll be a whole ton of Let's Plays, and then there'll be a, a whole ton of fan created, whether it's like comedies or shorts, or like some people are making like series based off of small games, like games that aren't even, you know, that are 100, 200, 500,000 units. Um, so for us, uh, while I think Quantum Break is at the highest end, which is, you know, actually building linear content for games in games, yeah. um, I think there are a whole bunch of different tiers, and the tier that we are most, the most interested is enabling and almost like making sure that fans have all the tools that they possibly can to create their own content, uh, traditional linear content, um, and then seeing where that can go. And I think, you're, I mean, I think going forward, you're gonna see a whole lot of people taking games that they love, doing these kind of YouTube-based content, and then if those games are big enough, that YouTube content will become partners with the studios to make more YouTube content that is, you know, outside of the just pure fandom. The, the, the cool thing about that, and I think that makes me think of something, is with games, we've allowed our fan base to use the content and distribute it on YouTube. So the IP restrictions have been lifted, and something yeah. that I think is a, a real learning for traditional media is if you want fans to carry the conversation on social media, they need to have the ability to remix their content and uh, grab it and distribute it and stuff. And there's been, you know, I think in the infancy of all that stuff, there were some publishers that were like, oh, what are we doing with that stuff? But now we recognize how powerful it is for discoverability or marketing your game or getting your community excited about your content. And that is, I think, you know, if to, for to, traditional media, there's something really powerful there. People like to see other people you know, remix, experience, experiment, discover the content. I mean, there's even unboxing videos that are massively popular, you know? So, so thinking about it that way, like restricting your IP is on social channels doesn't seem to be a good way to, uh, to, to make sure that the community really engages in it. I mean, to take it even a step further, let people make money off of your content. Let them yeah. monetize those videos. Let them think about it as a potential professional choice. Uh, you know, we have, we just have a page on our website that is like, here is a blanket permission to make as much money as you want by remixing and let's playing and taking our app. Like, whatever you want to do, just create with our stuff. We don't care because it all, in the end, it's just going to sell more copies of our game and it's going to create more hardcore fans. Um, and I, I think that there are so many tools out there that are enabling people to do that as well. And like we were talking about how easy, how easy it is to get games content onto uh, YouTube. 
I, I think that's, I mean, that is kind of like all of the different pieces of that process are, are in place. There is the most publishers and studios letting go of IP is something that we keep and you don't get in touch. There is the tools for actually capturing and sharing. There is, I mean, it takes yeah. 10 minutes to make a video now, less than 10 minutes to make a video now. And, and that's, that can be shared to, through all the social channels. It can be shared on your actual console to your actual friends list. Like it's, all those things are there and it does wonders for how games are sold. Yeah, and I think, A, thank you for doing my marketing for me, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, but uh, to the point that was made, like one of the things, especially for, again, a Quantum Break is a massive project, right? So especially the quality of the cast they had and so on and so forth, that is well beyond the capabilities, certainly most independent developers. I think actually engaging with your community, A, to sort of get them involved in the process themselves, is actually also how you foster and continue to build a relationship as you basically what you're referring to. Not only are you basically outsourcing the work to the community, but also and then you can basically find ways that to integrate. But since it, it gets them that much more invested because A, making video can be simple, but some of the amount of work that goes into sure. Machinima in particular, and, and oh my God, like it's just incredible the investment that people are making of their time voluntarily. They're not necessarily getting compensated, and then some of them will actually eventually build that into a, a sustainable business for themselves. Um, but it just is because they love the content so much. It's why they're doing it. It's because they love Assassin's Creed. It's because they love what basically you name it, that they're that heavily invested. And so it makes sense that, and we've learned this actually from YouTube, essentially is that find the creators that are sort of naturally wanting to do something and then you foster them rather than trying to necessarily execute a, a top-down strategy. A top-down strategy can work if you have the resources for it. But we found that at least certainly in, in, the, in the sort of social sphere, certainly with YouTube, that actually that was a much better approach, which is actually now why we partner with, with, with YouTube creators that have organically become successful on the platform by themselves because they're doing it because they're passionate about it and then they happen to make a living at it. Um, and that's actually a, a very good approach. We look at a title like Minecraft, and it's one that, you know, Minecraft's a phenomenon that started in a studio of 30-something you know, people that's grown to over 100 million unique users and, you know, one of, I think, top three games of all time. But you go on YouTube and just search for Minecraft, yeah. and it's like, it's, it's, like, it's like half of it's, yeah, it's yes. might be bigger than cats on YouTube, but um, <laughs> uh, you just see what those creators are, are doing, and it's nothing led by the developer or, or us as the the publisher and it's um, it's all fueled by the community and their passion for the the environment and what people do with Minecraft and so many people just go watch Minecraft they just to see what you what you do how you create certain things or just completely off the wall scenarios as well so it really is powered by the fans and the community and it just creates some great momentum in the brain. And, so, and when you engage your community they will take your content off in directions that you would never have anticipated um, very understandably sexy. when you're a brand you just you be a little uncomfortable with that. But again, actually the Minecraft example, that's, like again, things have been done with Minecraft that I could never possibly have imagined. Not least in which there's actually a, a UK creator called Stanley Longhead, uh, who actually, he built a, a classroom series that he teaches kids using Minecraft. Because he found that that was how he engaged them because all the kids were playing Minecraft, and so okay, well why don't we actually just do this live Minecraft, and actually use Minecraft to actually sort of instruct. Um, and so said, it's, it's the kind of thing I never would have anticipated, but it's amazing the kind of creativity you see. It, it, it leads me to, to, to coverage because back in the days when you you guys wanted to promote your games, uh, it was to traditional media, you know, TV shows. I uh, remember uh, Electric Playground on uh, the English side and Monsieur Net on the French side. Uh, those two TV shows doesn't exist anymore, but you have website and now you have all those Let's Play videos and, and everything that you, you can see on YouTube or, or on Twitch. Um, how do you guys leverage that? Um, do you or, or you just let it go organically? Well, it's, I, mean, I think it's a mix of both. It's like we were talking about engaging with the community. I, I think right now the person that talks about your game is not a journalist or uh, uh, someone who has a TV show. It's it's everyone. Yeah. So it's about embracing that to the fullest and like leveraging the community. Now like we were talking about earlier, it's having those hooks in the game that make you want to talk about it. You want people to be talking about your game everywhere and anywhere in any which way possible. And some of it might be uh, leveraging the, 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 the share button on your controller uh, to, uh, you know, uh, your game is hard and then there's going to be websites for people to try to figure out how to, you know, uh, to go through the game. That's community building right there. And it's, so it's, I, some games like Dark Souls I find it's massively successful by being obscure and hard and then people just go on the web to talk about it and there's this entire game outside the game of just trying to figure out how to you know, so so I think the way you're successful at it is just embracing the 
decentralization of you know how, how the community is just going to play your game and talk about it and share it on all the different channels. And we just look at it as like there's there's just like all of these boxes to check. Yeah. You know, you, 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 do you have websites covering your game? Yes. Do you have? Are you engaging with YouTube content creators? Yes. Are you having people or doing your own live streams on Twitch? Yes. Are you talking about it on social? And social for us, like Tumblr, is a lot bigger than people give it any credit for. It has to be you know, like a, a GIF or a picture. You can't just share text on Tumblr. But we have like four times more Tumblr followers than we do in all the rest of our social media combined. Um, it's like going through and just do it. Just do all of the stuff. Don't, don't like it. All actually matters, and it matters in different ways. And it matters you're engaging in or creating this kind of like beats in different ways. But like you know, for us, like getting an article in the Toronto Star still has a massive impact. That impact is markedly different than getting a YouTube content creator with a million subscribers. Like it's the the Toronto Star article is going to sell less copies. But then there is this kind of wider like validation where some players they'll you know they're my age and they read the paper in the morning and they're like oh there's a game company from Toronto cool that's I, I didn't know that um, it's it's making sure that you're kind of available in every format possible we still put a lot of value in traditional media we still put a lot of value in press we still put a lot of value in like in social in, you know, even though we know that Facebook is the kind of single best place to advertise your game, we still spend a ton of time on Twitter. We still use a lot of like we don't we're not on Friendster anymore. Uh, that's the only that's the only one that we cut off. Um, no, I think I think there's all of those opportunities. There's the when you're talking about promoting a game and marketing a game, there's no reason to not play every angle. Uh, but it does all boil down to really the community component is going to dwarf all of that, right? The, the getting people involved and passionate about your game and talking about your game. Uh, if you can do that through an IGN or through a Kotaku or through a smaller niche site that people, you know, that has a tenth or a hundredth of the users, um, that's awesome. But the goal is to bring them into the game. The goal is to get them to, to not just buy the damn thing, but to actually play it for a sustained period of time and, and to be one of those people online that is discussing how you beat it or why you're playing it or sharing your dumb clips or making fun of the bugs or you know breaking it on purpose, speed running it. Like all these things are, are that's the end goal is to take all of those check boxes and drive people into the game and have them stick there. The difference is that the people with like the IGNs or the Kotaku, they're part of the community. Yeah. So they're, they're like vocal, up. active members of the community. And that's, I think the fundamental difference is that they're all, it's all one community with different people talking about your game from a different perspective, mm -hmm. but it's still also, one community. And it's like when you have something that's really interesting and compelling, people will talk about it on IGN, on Kotaku, on YouTube, on Twitch, like, yeah. but it's, it's the same kind of content that activates the, 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 the desire to speak about it. That's what Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's wait for the time. Yeah, they're mic'd it up. Thanks very much. So, um, great discussion. Um, I have a number of questions, but I thought I'd just start with a general one. Um, so, video games have come a long way from the traditional 8 bit games to the super hyper realistic games of today. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> we're seeing um, Hollywood stars start to be uh, cast in these games. Uh, Ashmore was in Quantum Break, King Cliff was in Destiny, and we're seeing Hollywood start to make real content, feature films based on video games. Fastbender was just in Assassin's Creed. A lot of the big budget games have major Hollywood sort of size budgets. They're being promoted uh, on television through commercials in a way that a major Hollywood blockbuster would be. Um, Given this explosive growth, and you know, Canada has a massive video game industry, given this massive sort of explosion and growth of video games, both in sort of mainstream culture and, and as an in, in interest in society, is there, do you think, a public policy basis or rationale for perhaps um, investing more in, in the video game industry in the same way the government does with books, periodicals, movies, television, radio? Is, is, has, have video games sort of elevated themselves to a type of cultural expression that maybe warrants further support? I think we're, we're fortunate that, uh, I feel like in Canada, it is 
it is a big part. Like it is really recognized as a cultural expression, and we've we've seen a lot of support from from the government, from provincial governments, federal government about the industry and stuff. So I feel like we're we're in, in an industry right now where we are we are seeing that. Can it be more? Can it be recognized more? Yes, for sure. I mean, I think we have to fight for that all the time. There's always like censorship threats that are surfacing. We talk about stuff, and that stuff hurts the industry for sure. There's like you know. The, I don't think there's still a month, unfortunately, where there's still like a weird news broadcast where people talk about a game in a way that's kind of uh, dated. The, the violence, like I mean, I just remember the old uh, examples of like uh, you know uh, sexual stuff in Mass Effect, for instance, that kind of stuff. So it feels like you know there's still kind of like a, a feeling that games are for kids and that you can't deal with mature topics and stuff. And then you know. We're, we're out of that, I think, mostly, but uh, there's still uh, lingering kind of like effects from those uh, old discussions that we have to be really aware of and make sure we're protected. And I, I really, like, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that you're seeing interest from, like, uh, people that are in actively engaged in other industries, like music industry and the movie industry, like, see an interest and then you, you can see that it's all about brands, right? It's like you can build a brand now with, like, music and, and movies and games and we're certainly embracing that for yourself as much as we can, and that, that I, I, we're going to see a lot more of that going forward for sure. Yeah, my, I mean, my company was, in many ways, like started because of, or with the help of government support. We, we were a, a bunch of people who had never made video games trying to get into the industry. There were no jobs here at that time. This is uh, like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Uh, so we just decided to start our own thing. And, applied for a grant to, that covered half of travel costs to video game conferences uh, through the OMBC. That got us to our first game developers conference where we made, did the networking required to meet the people that would help us get contracts. Uh, our very, we did contract work forever. Our very first uh, like original IP Ontario owned content was part funded by the OMBC's Interactive Digital Media Fund. Um, We've received CMF. Our tax credits are actually pretty phenomenal. Uh, you know, always want more tax credits. <laughs> <laughs> but really, like we have, we I think we are kind of in the the top one percent of the world in terms of government support for the industry. Um, I, I I know for a fact that on the smaller studio side. Uh, Toronto specifically is kind of one of the culture, like one of the centers for independent creation, and part of that is specifically the OMBC. Uh, they they have gone out of their way, um, but then at the same time you have to recognize that there are also a bunch of kind of institutions in the city and in Ontario in general that are fighting for that as well. So the Interactive Ontario is the, the kind of like the, the the business kind of groups that are coming together to make sure that the government. Uh, actually understands it all because there are specific people there who do understand but maybe as a whole it requires a lot more effort um, and we've seen a lot of you know even just recently uh, a lot of positive changes kind of with the interactive digital media fund getting refunded that into it for independent studios or small creators uh, the IDMF is a, like it's, it's a pivotal piece it's the thing that helps you get out of working for someone else and start working for yourself and creating those Canadian pieces of content that are actually, you know, ours, that are actually owned by us. And that's, we, without that kind of existing and then kind of somewhat growing support, my, I don't think my studio ever would have had a chance to do anything other than make games for other people. Um, and then once we had that chance, we were able to prove ourselves, and that's the last six or seven years of my company has been making original content for us, by us. Um, but again, it all kind of starts with that that kind of piece of, specifically OMBC, those they've been the most important, I think, to Toronto. But Canada wide, the CMF and what used to be Telephone, I, I, those those pieces are fundamental to how we've I think managed to grow studios uh, in this like start studios in Ontario or in Canada and then grow them. Um, a lot of the big, almost I would say all of the big companies are transplants in our industry. There aren't any really massive. Uh, Canadian publishers, um, but on the flip side, there is a, a, an amazingly strong kind of small studio, you know, 100 people or less, specifically 25 people or less uh, in the country, specifically in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. And a lot of that is, I mean, 
BC doesn't have, doesn't enjoy the same uh, benefits that we do here in Ontario, but they still have fantastic support even there. Yeah, just to quickly supplement what, what Nathan said, it's worth well pointing out, like Canada, specifically Quebec, pretty much pioneered the tax credit model, um, and it has been the envy of the world, to which the many other countries have basically a stroke, a stroke to emulate it. It's been supplemented by, again, public policy decisions that were made to do things like the Interactive Digital Media Fund with the OMC and kind of equivalents in other provinces, which have been a massive boon. I, I am comfortable saying the industry in Canada would not be what it is but for these decisions. It actually operates in a very different way also than, say, what we see on the broadcasting side, insofar as that it really is informed by an economic development mandate, where it's like, you know, well, we see this as an issue that we really want to develop because we see this as being hugely explosive, it will lead to good jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, versus say a cultural policy mandate, which is they see on the broadcasting side, yeah. and which is why it's all been about again public financing from the government versus say a, a broadcasting regime, which is a combination of, of public financing and, and uh, mandatory contributions, right. because as the industries operate very very differently. Yes, I think I think we have uh, time for more questions. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. Hi, um, it's really funny how you guys just did that lead in because I work for Telecom Canada and uh, I'm really happy to hear that our sister agency, the CMF, and uh, how that's supporting uh, independent uh, companies and production. Um, my question, I look at consumer behavior, and uh, we finance independent film, and obviously Netflix was a game changer. And I read about two weeks ago that Steam's getting into uh, film and television um, subscription video on demand model. Um, I would just and I don't know if you guys can answer this, but I would like you to kind of make a bit of a prediction of how big of a game changer that's going to be. I really feel like it's, we might see this type of um, consumer behavior change that we saw with Netflix, where people are basically using that on a daily basis to view films. And, and you know, if the in independent Canadian cinema, how they should be responding to that. It's a difficult question to answer. I feel like uh, I feel like you know, you know you know with the, with Steam, I feel like um, gamers or, or the gaming community, I'd say in general, are comfortable with buying games online, a digital transaction, uh, uh, having a bunch of digital licenses for a lot of games in their libraries and stuff. So I feel like in a way, it's a natural evolution for them because they have a community of people who are who are are there or constantly going back to the platform. So they're kind of like expanding and, and I guess testing out how much they can expand the platform to other type of media and content. So I think that makes sense. Um, I think like we were talking earlier, we're still at the level of experimentation. Uh, like is it gonna be, you know, I, I mean even Xbox is doing a lot of it. And uh, you know, I, I think I watch most of my content on my gaming consoles now. Is it because I'm a gamer or is that a, a, a trend that's harder for me to, to talk about? I think it's interesting to note, like there have been a lot of other companies take make forays into, or like gaming companies making forays into creating content or supporting content. I mean, Microsoft for a while was making their own stuff and then stopped. Um, I think it's a very, like, the thing that I, I, I believe very strongly is that uh, people who play video games consider themselves kind of part of the gaming culture. And that is very specific to games. Somehow YouTube merged into that. I don't really know exactly why. I think, that, I think it's because it's short and simple and, and extremely easy to consume. I, I think uh, kind of television content uh, has a really tough battle getting into, well, I think film content, I think any content that isn't games and or extremely short form uh, uh, or like created for YouTube content is gonna have an extremely tough time breaking through. I think we've seen a ton of, uh, we've seen a ton of brands, uh, specifically like huge blockbuster films try to come into video games and fail miserably time after time after time after time. I mean the biggest brands in film fail on fail on in, in, in gaming content. The Deadpools and X-Men's and Spider-Man's and all of those games fail. Um, going the other way we've seen some luck with gaming content going into films. Um, but if I was an independent television or film producer 
uh, I, I would look, I would be very cautious about kind of trying to break down that wall because I think it is a very sturdy one. I think it's, especially on PC, they're the most kind of intense and rapid and uh, uh, strong-willed players. I think console players are much more, uh, yeah, they're, they're people who play video games on PC care about playing video games on PC. People who play games on console care about playing cool games a lot. They'll play on PC as well, but PC gamers rarely play anywhere else. So anyways, long story short, I, do, I think it's a very challenging space to try to, to get into. I think it's extremely challenging to try to bring your brands into video games. I think it's extremely challenging to try to build content for gaming culture if you're not already kind of just a fan of gaming culture. To do it with a business purpose, I think, is going to lead to a lot of very challenging moments. Yeah, I mean, for Xbox, like, um, definitely for us, you know, gaming is the number one priority on our platform, but we know those gamers also, you know, they want the Netflix, they want the YouTube, the Twitch streaming, um, and even live TV, and so you can put your live TV through a console, and it gives you, and it's a Blu-ray player, so it gives you the option to consume whatever type of entertainment content you want to engage in through our platform whenever you want. Um, so I think it's less of a question about what Steam doing and more of a question of what does a consumer want to do, and are they going to find value in that service over what they already have? Uh, and I think that's the ultimate challenge in trying to expand what could be a ubiquitous entertainment offerings across other devices or platforms or services, is that there has to be some value there for the consumer. Ours is, is that we have a really kick-ass gaming machine, in addition to all of the live TV, Blu-ray, and entertainment apps that you typically use on your devices as well. Yeah, essentially, I agree with a lot of what Nathan was saying. Is that I think I think it can be done as long as it's handled extremely carefully. There have been some like, yep. successful examples of crossovers, but I think it's really difficult. I think sometimes, again, things that I'm sure seem like a good idea at the time turn out to not that desperately not be. <laughs> the age of the content that you see that's successful on the YouTube platform, even stuff that kind of is a little more equivalent to, say, scripted, for lack of a better term, but again, it tends to be a lot more aligned to machinima and, and that kind of thing, which is resonating with a pre-existing fan base. And actually, it's generally, it's playing off what they expect from the content. Often it's very humorous and satirical and so forth. And so there's ways to potentially leverage that, but I also see it's the kind of thing that does very, very well by being consumed on the same platforms that people are also consuming in the gaming content. So trying to convert that to a feature is going to be a different experience. Although again, it's not to say it can't work as through digital distribution. Um, and certainly we have, again, occasions where there's no such thing for YouTube as a sort of a fixed or optimal length of time or in terms of video or tend, trends towards short-term, co sorry, short-form content, but not necessarily. It really depends on the audience and what it is that you're producing. And so there's certainly a case where it would work. It just would have to be handled very well. Cool. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Hi. So this is going to be kind of a difficult question. My main concern for a video game is while I love the medium, it's my favorite medium of all, I think the main discoverability problem is it's such a niche market and it's kind of fringe and it's not mainstream. So my question is, is how do we make more people into gamers so that they're interested in consuming the great content we're producing in Canada? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's like a strange thing in that it's, it's the most financially successful entertainment medium on the planet and it is, it, I, I agree that it is still fringe in the sense that, you know, we're still, like Alex said, shaking off the Toys for Boys kind of mentality that has attached itself to games. Um, and doing it, I think we're doing a really good job at getting rid of that. Um, honestly, I think a big part of it is, uh, is to make, spending the time and putting the effort in to make sure that all parts of our content is, uh, are, Kind of open uh, are for everyone, so we're not we're not you know even the Call of Duties, which are kind of a the most popular, but b also the most like typical in a way, violent kind of like male power fantasy air quotes. Um, they are even spending a huge amount of time and effort into making their games more diverse and more kind of open to everybody who would want to be interested. My sister is a hardcore Call of Duty player, uh, like way, way too much Call of Duty. Um, but it's only been recently that she's gotten into it because it, it is slowly kind of becoming a, a piece of the puzzle. And I, I think 
as games become, as we're willing to tackle the things that the more mature kind of content, as we're willing to treat violence, treat sex, treat uh, like interpersonal relationships as uh, uh, serious, as real, as you know, make things that aren't just pure into the industry. There were no jobs here at that time. This is uh, like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Uh, so we just decided to start our own thing and applied for a grant to, that covered half of travel costs to video game conferences uh, through the OMBC. That got us to our first game developers conference where we made, did the networking required to meet the people that would help us get contracts. Uh, our very, we did contract work forever. Our very first uh, like original IP Ontario owned content was part funded by the OMBC's Interactive Digital Media Fund. Um, we've received CMF. Our tax credits are actually pretty phenomenal. Uh, you know, always want more tax credits. <laughs> but really, like we have, we I think we are kind of in the the top one percent of the world in terms of government support for the industry. Um, I, I know for a fact that on the smaller studio side, uh, Toronto specifically is kind of one of the culture, like one of the centers for independent creation. And part of that is specifically the OMBC. Uh, they, they have gone out of their way. Um, but then at the same time, you have to recognize that there are also a bunch of kind of institutions in the city and in Ontario in general that are fighting for that as well. So the Interactive Ontarios and the, the kind of like the, the, the business kind of groups that are coming together to make sure that the government does, actually understands it all. Because there are specific people there who do understand, but maybe as a whole, it requires a lot more effort. Um, and we've seen a lot of, you know, even just recently, uh, a lot of positive changes kind of go with the Interactive Digital Media Fund getting refunded. That into, it, for independent studios or small creators, uh, the IDMF is a, like it's, it's a pivotal piece. It's the thing that helps you get out of working for someone else and start working for yourself and creating those Canadian pieces of content that are actually you know ours that are actually owned by us. And that's we without that kind of existing and then kind of somewhat growing support, my, I don't think my studio ever would have had a chance to do anything other than make games for other people. Um, and then once we had that chance we were able to prove ourselves, and that's the last six or seven years of my company has been making original content for us, by us. Um, but again, it all kind of starts with that that kind of piece of, specifically OMBC, those they've been the most important, I think, to Toronto, but Canada-wide, the CMF, and what used to be Telefilm, I, I, those, those pieces are fundamental to how we've, I think, managed to grow studios uh, in this, like start studios in Ontario or in Canada, and um, a lot of the big, almost, I would say all of the big companies are transplants in our industry. There aren't any really massive uh, Canadian publishers. Um, but on the flip side, there is a, a, an amazingly strong kind of small studio, you know, 100 people or less, specifically 25 people or less uh, in the country, specifically in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. And a lot of that is, I mean, BC doesn't have, doesn't enjoy the same uh, benefits that we do here in Ontario, but they still have fantastic support even then. Yeah, just to quickly supplement what, what Nathan said, it's worth one point like Canada, specifically Quebec, pretty much pioneered the tax credit model, um, and it has been the envy of the world, to which that many other countries have basically a stroke, a stroke to emulate it. It's been supplemented by, again, public policy decisions that were made to do things like the Interactive Digital Media Fund with the OMBC and kind of equivalents in other provinces, which have been a massive boon. I, I am comfortable saying the industry in Canada would not be what it is but for these decisions. It actually operates in a very different way also than, say, what we see on the broadcasting side, insofar as that it really is informed by an economic development mandate, where it's like, you know, we see this as an issue that we really want to develop because we see this as being hugely explosive, it will lead to good jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, versus say a cultural policy mandate, which is see on the broadcasting side, and which is why it's all been about again public financing from the government versus say a, a broadcasting regime, which is a combination of, of public financing and, and uh, mandatory contributions, because as the industries operate very very differently. Yes, I think I think we have uh, time for more questions. Uh, microphone. Oh yeah, there you go. Hi. Um, 
It's really funny how you guys just did that lead in because I work for Telecom Canada and uh, I'm really happy to hear that you're financed for our sister agency, the CMF, and uh, how that's supporting uh, independent uh, companies and production. Um, my question, I look at consumer behavior and uh, we finance independent film and obviously Netflix was a game changer. And I read about two weeks ago that Steam's getting into uh, film and television subscription video on demand model. Um, I would just, and I don't know if you guys can answer this, but I would like you to kind of make a bit of a prediction of how big of a game changer that's going to be. I really feel like it's, we might see this type of um, consumer behavior change that we saw with Netflix where people are basically using that on a daily basis to view films. And, and uh, you know, if the in independent Canadian cinema how they should be responding to that. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. I feel like, uh, I feel like, you know, you know, you know with, the, with Steam, I feel like um, gamers or, or the gaming community, I'd say in general, are comfortable with buying games online, a digital transaction, uh, uh, having a bunch of digital licenses for a lot of games in their libraries and stuff. So. I feel like in a way it's a natural evolution for them because they have a community of people who are who are are there or are constantly going back to the platform. So they're kind of like expanding and, and I guess testing out how much they can expand the platform to other type of media and content. So I think that makes sense. Um, I think like we were talking earlier, we're still at the level of experimentation. Uh, like is it going to be you know I, I mean even Xbox is doing a lot of it and uh, you know, I. I think I watch most of my content on my gaming consoles now. Um, is it because I'm a gamer? Or is it a, 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 a trend that's harder for me to, to talk about? I think it's interesting to note, like there have been a lot of other companies take make forays into, or like gaming companies making forays into creating content or supporting content. I mean, Microsoft for a while was making their own stuff and then stopped. Um, I think it's a very, like, the thing that I, I, I believe very strongly is that uh, people who play video games consider themselves kind of part of the gaming culture. And that is very specific to games. Somehow YouTube merged into that. I don't really know exactly why. I think, that, I think it's because it's short and simple and, and extremely easy to consume. I, I think uh, kind of television content uh, has a really tough battle getting into, well, I think film content, I think any content that isn't games and or extremely short form uh, uh, or like created for YouTube content is gonna have an extremely tough time breaking through. I think we've seen a ton of, uh, we've seen a ton of brands, uh, specifically like huge blockbuster films try to come into video games and fail miserably time after time after time after time. I mean the biggest brands in film fail on content, fail on in, in, in gaming content. The Deadpools and X-Men's and Spider-Man's and all of those games fail. Um, going the other way we've seen some luck with gaming content going into films. Um, but if I was an independent television or film producer uh, I, if I would look, I would be very cautious about kind of trying to break down that wall because I think it is a very sturdy one. I think it's, especially on PC, they're the most kind of intense and rabid and uh, uh, strong-willed players. I think console players are much more, uh, yeah, they're, they're people who play video games on PC care about playing video games on PC. People who play games on console care about playing cool games a lot. They'll play on PC as well, but PC gamers rarely play anywhere else. So, anyways, long story short, I do. I think it's a very challenging space to try to, to get into. I think it's extremely challenging to try to bring your brands into video games. I think it's extremely challenging to try to build content for gaming culture if you're not already kind of just a fan of gaming culture. To do it with a business purpose, I think, is going to lead to a lot of very challenging moments. Yeah, I mean, for Xbox, like, um, definitely for us, you know, gaming is the number one priority on our platform, but we know those gamers also, you know, they want their Netflix, they want the YouTube, their Twitch streaming, uh, 
even live TV, and so you can play your live TV through a console, and it gives you, and it's a Blu-ray player, so it gives you the option to consume whatever type of entertainment content you want to engage in through our platform whenever you want. Um, so I think it's less of a question about what Steam doing and more of a question of what does a consumer want to do and are they going to find value in that service over what they already have. Uh, and I think that's the ultimate challenge in trying to expand what could be a ubiquitous entertainment offerings across other devices or platforms or services is that there has to be some value there for the consumer. Ours is is that we have a really kick-ass gaming machine in addition to all of the live TV, Blu-ray, and entertainment apps that you typically use on your devices as well. Yeah, that's exactly, I agree with a lot with what Nathan was saying is that I think I think it can be done as long as it's handled extremely carefully. There have been some yep. successful examples of crossovers, but I think it's really difficult. I think sometimes, again, things that I'm sure seem like a good idea at the time turn out to not, that definitely not be. <laughs> the age of the content that we see that's successful on the YouTube platform, even stuff that kind of is a little more equivalent to, say, scripted, for lack of a better term. But again, it tends to be a lot more aligned to machinima and, and that kind of thing, which is resonating with a pre existing fan base. And actually, is generally, it's playing off what they expect from the content. Often it's very humorous and satirical and so forth. And so there's ways to potentially leverage that, but I also see it's the kind of thing that does very, very well by being consumed on the same platforms that people are also consuming in the gaming content. So trying to convert that to a feature is going to be a different experience. Although again, it's not to say it can't work as through digital distribution. Um, and certainly we have, again, occasions where there's no such thing for YouTube as a sort of a fixed or optimal length of time or in terms of video or tend, trends toward short term, co sorry, short form content, but not necessarily. It really depends on the audience and what it is that you're producing. And so there's certainly occasions where it would work. It just would have to be handled very well. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. So this is going to be kind of a difficult question. My main concern for a video game is, while I love the medium, it's my favorite medium of all, I think the main discoverability problem is it's such a niche market and it's kind of fringe and it's not mainstream. So my question is, is how to make more people into gamers so that they're interested in consuming the great content we're producing in Canada? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a strange thing in that it's it's the most financially successful entertainment medium on the planet, and it is, it, I, I agree that it is still fringe in the sense that, you know, we're still, like Alex said, shaking off the Toys for Boys kind of mentality that has attached itself to games. Um, and doing it, I think we're doing a really good job at getting rid of that. Um, honestly, I think a big part of it is, uh, is to make, spending the time and putting the effort in to make sure that all parts of our content is, uh, are kind of open, uh, are for everyone. So we're not, we're not, you know, even the Call of Duties, which are kind of A, the most popular, but B, also the most like typical in a way, violent kind of like male power fantasy air quotes. Um, they are even spending a huge amount of time and effort into making their games more diverse and more kind of open to everybody who would want to be interested. My sister is a hardcore Call of Duty player, uh, like way, way too much Call of Duty. Um, but it's only been recently that she's gotten into it because it, it is slowly kind of becoming a, a piece of the puzzle. And I, I think as games become, as we're willing to tackle the things that the more mature kind of content as we're willing to treat violence, treat sex, treat uh, like interpersonal relationships as uh, uh, serious, as real, as you know, make things that aren't just purely fantasies. Uh, I, I think that's actually going to help a lot. I, I think people will start to notice that some of the more popular games nowadays, even the ones that are the most fantastical and take place on a far out planet between you know, dragons and gnomes, they are starting to tackle some of the more serious kind of life issues because uh, that is a, 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 it actually makes financial sense. It is actually making your games more interesting and playable and diverse actually equates to making them more consumable and sellable. I think part of it too is, I think it's just it, it takes time too, right? Like I think the video game industry as we know it, like if you think back tomorrow, you're talking like early 1980s. In terms of video games as actual real blockbuster entertainment, maybe I think of Halo 2 as one of the first titles that really kind of 
got that type of attention and blockbuster status being compared to movies, and that was 2004, 2005. So you're talking about industry that's been kind of thrust in this position just over the past decade. Um, and so it just takes time to kind of work through that. We, we've done things on Xbox like Connect and have tried to broaden through different types of gameplay experiences um, fr from that perspective. But I, I think you're bang on everything that, that you said. And I, I think there's just the reality too in terms of it being a relatively young industry compared to other entertainment vehicles. That's just going to take time to kind of reach maturity and people to be okay with understanding that there are games for everyone and it's not always Call of Duty or Halo or GTA all the time. I mean, we're saying I'm French, but I, I, to offer a counter argument, that was I was in a high school speaking with students maybe you know, six months ago, and I had the first question I asked is who's played a game in the last week, and everyone raised their hand. So everyone's playing games now, and maybe on their phones or something. Platforms are more accessible than they've ever been. So I, I actually feel like even though aspects of the game industry are more like on the fringe, and there's work to do there, like gaming in general is extremely pervasive, and it, like everyone's like the, the big franchises, everyone's heard of them, and it can be like, you know, if you extend gaming to Candy Crush, like, you know, my dad plays games every day. So it's 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 different than it was like 10 years ago. Yeah, I understand what you mean, but uh, as I, I would say, like, this is one of the smallest summit attendants I've seen of the weekend. That's kind of what I mean, and that maybe the next generation, everyone's into games, that, and maybe we're the, you know, the forerunner of this, like, future extra youth, you know, it's just culture industry um, segment, but it's still by, by the wide public, and it's not, it's not covered, you know, by CBC, it's, it's barely covered, you know, by the main media, so that's kind of what, I know that the younger generation is really into gaming, but how do we legitimize in the face of, you know, policymaker and main media? I, I, take, I take your point, I actually agree with what you said, that actually I don't think it's as fringe as people may think. From certain perspectives, it is fringe. And actually, to be honest, what, everything that you've basically talked about with respect to the fact that there's the lack of coverage in the mainstream media, certainly in this country anyway, um, and so on and so forth, is actually more of a function of the disconnect between the, some of our kind of established media entities and actually what we're sort of seeing in the online space, of which gaming is almost at the forefront of that, stuff that we see on YouTube is the forefront of that. And there is a cultural issue, and I mean cultural in the sense of that, that people haven't caught up to what you said. It's, it's generational, it will happen, it's basically people, as the younger people who grew up gaming age, and frankly they're still gaming, a lot of them, and whether or not they basically still game on console, or maybe they migrate to mobile, because mobile and tablets have actually radically expanded the market. It may be a different style of gaming, but it's still gaming, because we're, we're talking about more kind of the, the bigger budget, cinematographic style gaming here. Um, I do think it will change over time. I think actually you're going to see some of that coverage. And but also, it just it's the demographics change. If, if a lot of the audiences that we're talking about tend to engage with the communities in sort of online, and to be honest, they may not be reading a CBC article. To Nathan's point we said earlier, there's a big lift that you get if you get mainstream coverage. But that's to an audience which isn't necessarily the same audience. And I think that we're going to see catching up that happens over time. We're just not quite there yet. Um, yeah. I, but I also, I mean, I, I do, like, I'm used to, I'm totally comfortable with sitting on panels where literally no one in the audience has heard of my company or played any of our games. It's, it's normal, right? It, it, I mean, probably most people here have barely heard of Ubisoft. You know, and probably they're like, oh, I know Microsoft, I, 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 my kids have an Xbox. Uh, those are the type of panels that, that we're consistently on. Mm -hmm. right? Because especially when it comes to speaking out, like if we go to the Game Developers Conference, the, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a foil. You already know that everybody is, knows who you are because they're at the Game Developers Conference. But going outside of video games, it's, it's a total norm, especially in Canada, uh, where there is, you know, there, I think the kind of, the industry or the, the country in general has been kind of so intensely focused on linear media, music, and specifically film in terms of, uh, you know, how we expound Canadian culture, how we build kind of the, the Canadian entertainment industries worldwide. Um, but that's just, like it, like you mentioned, it's just a part of a, a, a process. The, eventually the, the folks who are in charge of that will not be in charge of that anymore. And considering how challenging that is, and, and, and it's, you know, it's something that we just kind of have to accept and, uh, you know, understand. Um, but considering how that is the case, I believe how it, there are so many 
Uh, there is so often that we go into sessions with people who are not in the game industry that don't really know who any of us are. Uh, I still think it's really interesting that we have the most support of, of any kind of, or almost any country in the world. It's, it's this really strange imbalance that I don't totally understand. Um, and I think that there are some, I'm, maybe it comes down to a few great people and a few great business organizations pushing for it and they get the right ears of the right people. But um, part of it is just uh, uh, continually forcing video game sessions down people's throats. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a good word, actually. So, like, if there is a conference on entertainment or on discoverability or on social <laughs> or on, and there's not a gaming component there, somebody has this point. For, for Canada, it's, I, I find it, like in terms of media export, video games reach out to millions and millions of people outside of Canada, and those games are made by Canadians. So yeah. in terms of just that, it makes me immensely proud yeah. of the work that's been done. I mean, and it's like year on year on year, the best video games on all platforms that are made are, you know, the major concentration are made by Canadians. So that's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's something that needs to be recognized for sure. Well, thanks a lot, guys. We're out of time. Um, thanks, Jason, Jeff, Nathan, and Alex. Um, so, yeah, see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.